Okay, comments. The attack, the attack on the um, construction division of the CFMEU nationally and in five state branches by the Albanese government means the union is at a crossroads uh, fighting for the right to represent building, building workers. I was a building worker for 18 years and I remain a proud union member. It's a dusty, dirty, noisy and dangerous job and the union has an excellent record in fighting for the safety of all workers on building sites. The idea that we should go home unscathed at the end of a day's work is not an impossible dream. The union is under attack from the Albanese uh, Labor government, um, but the union leaders in each affected state don't know how to respond to the, a full-on government attack. The union is used to fighting small guerrilla battles with builders whose short-sightedness agreed the union actually turns to its own advantage. I'll get back to these points. The allegations of corruption against three key leaders in the Victorian and New South Wales branches and the string of minor positions in the mainstream media has seen the Albanese government go from zero to nuclear uh, in, in a matter of days. Uh, Labor has done this in order to prove to the Australian ruling class that it is a safe pair of hands. Um, with the police leaking the limited evidence they have to the media, uh, because it doesn't actually meet the threshold of laying criminal charges. Some, in going, some of those going back to 2019. So what we're actually seeing is, is a trial by media. A well-orchestrated plan has begun to attack the five branches in, in what I would call an unholy alliance between the mainstream media, the Labor government and the Australian Council of uh, Trade Unions, the ACTU. And this is after years of media campaigning against the CFMEU. It's alleged corruption two costly royal commissions, at least in my time, which ran into the tens of millions of dollars. Those royal commissions have only ever thrown mud at the union, hoping to make some of that mud stick. Uh, no one has, no, um, one has ever uh, ha had a, la a charge, substantial charge laid against them by those royal commissions, but the groundwork has been um, laid to the assault of the, of the, of the, on, on the construction division. Now, within days of these supposedly new corruption allegations in the Nine Fairfax Media in mid-July against the Victorian branch leader John Setka, the Industrial Relations Minister, Tony Burke, was on the ABC's um, Sunday Insiders program saying that all the legal options were on the table to attack the union, including deregistration. Burke sub subsequently ruled out deregistration, saying that this would leave the union still capable of bargaining and doing the entire business model we're seeing with no layer of regulation or additional oversight. What he means is that without the sticky fingers of the Fair Work Commission, the FWC, controlling the union's ev every move. And then from, from 1973 to 1976, the Builders' Labourers Federation, one of the predecessor unions of the CFMU, was deregistered by a federal Liberal government and it kept going outside the arbitration system. Um, in that era, the ACTU refused to allow any poaching of BLF members by other construction unions. Today, some on the, uh, on the left and the unions are already saying we need to respond to all the continued calls by the Liberals and their stooges, like a former Royal Commissioner, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the, the idea that the union is going to be um, deregistered. We need to be absolutely clear. The Fair Work Commission um, appointed administrators and not deregistration is Labor's main line of attack of, on the union. Those administrators can effectively mothball the union. And some of the new news articles are saying now, uh, now are saying that th that mothballing could be for a year or even longer. On day three, the Monday two days ago, the Albanese government was unwilling to accept the National Office of the CFMEU immediately putting the Victorian branch into its own internal administration with an independent lawyer to tra trawl through all the corruption allegations. As of then, the Victorian branch executive can make no decisions. In, in, and um, Albanese didn't like it. Instead, the federal government ordered the Anti-Union Fair Work Commission to draw up plans to appoint administrators in uh, the uh, five state branches on, on day four. Now, the, that person who is doing it is the Fair Work General Mar Manager, Murray Furlong, who used to be part of the extrajudicial body funded by the Liberal government from 2004 which was called the Australian Building and Construction Commission, the ABCC. 
It was staffed with ex-coppers and it attacked any union stoppage in construction as some sort of, uh, some sort of criminal activity. I personally know one of these strikes where the union followed up on the payments for some landscapers on the job I was at at the time. They had a hard half-day stoppage. When those landscapers hadn't fully been paid by the same employer at a, previous, um, a, a previously completed job, um, when the strike happened, the ABCC came down to that like a rash and it was given a short shrift by the shop steward who told them to go away or words to that effect. The landscapers received the back pay that they were owed. The Fair Work Commission masquerades as an independent body but is fully funded by the federal government and its judges are political appointees from both sides of politics. Fair Work's anti-union bias is written into its mission statement. On day five, the um, FWC applied to the federal court for powers to appoint administrators in each branch of the CFMEU. Under administration, as I said, a branch executive can make no decisions. It's subject to the dictatorial powers of the administrator who controls all the union's funds and assets. In effect, the branch is mothballed. Um, to the extent that the union could service its members over paying conditions is unclear. But I'm confident in saying that the CFMEU could not be, um, would not be able to, to, to do that under administration and the union would bleed members. Unusually, on the same day as the Fair Work um, Commission's court application for the right to appoint administrators, the ACTU met with an agenda which included putting the five branches of the CFMU into administration in agreement with the Albanese government. The branch secretary of the Queensland branch, um, Michael Rabbar, Queensland and Northern Territory, was rightfully livid with Albanese and the ACTU for agreeing to include his branch, which has no allegations of corruption. All those allegations in the paper, the Queensland branch, there is not one allegation of corruption. And he said, I will defend the integrity of this CFMU every day of the week. If Albanese or any other politicians wants to properly investigate criminality, they should start at the top and not at the bottom. The real crooks in this industry are the civil contractors and their cronies. The lack of um, con uh, corruption allegations in the Queensland branch points to why the Albanese government is attacking the construction division. The union's militancy makes it stand out. The corruption allegations are, co are a convenient cover for Labor's attacks. And who benefits from the attacks on the, on, on the construction unions in five states? The Albanese government may be leading the charge, but it's the building company bosses who stand the game. With, uh, to, to gain with the threats of uh, enterprise bargaining agreements, EBA is torn up by the administrators because they are somehow corrupt, linked to a um, corrupt official, tainted, etc., thus forcing down wages and conditions to award um, as those EBAs are above award payments. And while we're talking about EBAs, it also hints at the possibility of another union, the right-wing Australian Workers' Union, gaining ground and members at the expense of the CFMEU while it is mothballed. The building industry has some very rich and powerful co um, companies who tend to work subcontract to smaller companies, and those smaller companies subcon um, which engage in cost-cutting and cutthroat competition. The industry lends itself to corruption as there are huge profits to be made and the building companies are willing to throw money around to make problems go away. And there's already allegations of you know, bribery by the, this and that building firm. Nothing, no, no charges for them. Um, and, and I don't believe the fingers of, of this particular class enemy, John Davies, he's the CEO of the Australian Constructors Association. He estimates that the productivity in the construction industry over the last 30 years is 33% behind all other industries. Now, John is a very smart man. He's estimated if you apply the 33% uh, uh, being behind and, and, and productivity was, in, was improved, the contribution to, to the economy, you would get $56 billion. $56 billion. That's the opportunity if we close the gap. Even if, they got a, if builders got a quarter of that money, they, they, they would go after it. By, get rid of, by getting rid of the CFMEU, builders hope to get their hands on billions. Now, the, the building bosses have always had the, had the unions. No surprise. From the Sydney stonemasons winning the eight-hour day on two jobs in October 1855 with a reduction of pay. 
The more militant Melbourne stone masons won the hour day in March of 1856 with no reduction of pay. And building unions have been the pace setters for other unions uh, in this country. Since 1856, workers in Australia have been fighting for an eight-hour day in an era when there were 10 and 12-hour working days and when workers had to work half a day or full day Saturdays in order to keep their job. It took until 1916 for Victoria and New South Wales to legislate for, um, uh, for those states to have eight-hour days, and that's after years of strike and, and a whole bunch of industry. It took until 1948 for the 40-hour, five-day week to be legislated for all workers in Australia. And during the post-World War II boom and in the lead-up to the Melbourne Olympics, all Victorian construction unions, so that is... Carpenters, bricklayers, labourers, painters, plasterers, scaffolders, electricians and plumbers won the standardisation of overward payment, uh, payments across the industry in what was known as the Victorian Building Industry Agreement of 1955. And that was won by strike action. Um, and this included a ghost low for six weeks by 600 workers at the Dandenong, um, uh, a Dandenong building site. And as the left-wing um, leader of the New South Wales BLF of the early 1970s, Jack Mundy, noted, in Victoria there was an over-award agreement which had been struck before the 1956 Olymp- Olympics, with pay rates substantially higher than in other states. In New South Wales, some over-award payments had been won by direct action, but they did not cover the whole industry. So that the success of a union in one state would lead to other states trying to, to catch up to those same pay rates and better conditions. And the unions were resisted every step of the way by the greedy uh, building companies. Um, this is the, this is the Vic, um, Victorian Building Industry Agreement of 2000 and, um, to 2005 to remind the uncivilised bosses what their obligations are to their workers. The CFMEU's national and, and state branch leadership in the past 14 days, their response to this um, attack of them has been underwhelming to say the least. There have been no calls for mass meetings for members, no talk of strike action, but only the talk of business as usual. Stacking the Labor Party to change the internal dynamics inside the party. Possible court cases by the Queensland branch, the national office, to challenge Fair Work's uh, um, legal right to appoint administrators. Albanese and Burke's response to any possible legal challenge is to say they will draft laws to override any legal challenge when Federal Parliament resumes on the 12th of August. So it's a very tight um, timetable, very um, time frame. Finally, yesterday, the Queensland branch held an extraordinary uh, delegates meeting in Brisbane to respond to the attacks. Um, and it's some, of the, some of the visions going around on... on on, on Facebook and, and, and at, at the moment. But again, it was a missed opportunity. Michael Rabbar, the State Secretary, who were quoted earlier about fighting um, um, Albanese, took the wind out of the sails of the angry delegates who wanted to, to fight as of today. And, and, he, and he said, oh, they want us to strike, so we shouldn't strike. Um, uh, we need to be disciplined. In our industry, meaning to be disciplined means do whatever the, the, the leadership says. Um, uh, one Brisbane um, uh, site um, today passed a more militant motion where we have a comrade um, um, working there to strike and prevent any administrator entering the union office, having a blockade of the union office. Three shifts of the, um, of the MUA at Hutchinson's and um, Stevedore's in Sydney, um, where we have uh, two comrades, also passed a motion in support of the CFMEU. So part of the, part of the process of getting unions to support the CFMEU is starting. While um, um, we're talking about now, um, the bosses are actually thinking about 1986. Um, Danita Warne is the current CEO of the Master Builders Association of Australia. She recalls Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke deregistering the Builders Labor Federation in '86, and she labelled this attack as a déjà vu moment. In 1986, BLF union members were denied the union of their choice at police gunpoint on Victorian government orders. Their union leader, Norm Gallagher, was jailed on corruption charges. Their organisers were jailed for days on end. And the union's office was legally seized. A a sequestration, sequestration. They were sequestered with the police raiding the, the membership lists and the union funds taken by the Victorian government. 
Many of us at the time when we heard this, no one had ever heard of sequestration. It's just an obscure legal term passed down from the Middle Ages. The state government appointed an administrator who ran the union and froze the union's um, state and federal fund, funds initially until 1991. And then that was rolled over and extended to 2002 when the funds were ha- finally handed back um, um, from the BLF to the CFMEU. The BLF was deregistered federally in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, uh, then its largest areas of membership. And the laws that were passed were passed simultaneously by Bob Hawke and the two state Labor premiers. The BLF had been too successful for members, winning pay rises, shorter hours and safer working conditions. The union also had a proud record of supporting Aboriginal land rights, the environment and been made famous by the Green Bands in, in New South Wales in the, in the early 19, 1970s. And it was the BLF's opposition to the Hawke government's prices and incomes accord which finally led to its deregistration. The accord was an agreement which was a cap on wage rises and I don't have time to go into it, perhaps someone from the floor can, can explain it. Suffice to say, in late 1984, the financial review gloated. The Hawke government has become a jailer for unions which dare to buck the accord consensus and the ACTU has become the industrial police force. The BLF did not appreciate how far the ACTU and the Labor Party were willing to, um, to go to protect the accord, which was Labor's way of managing uh, Australian capitalism. Long-term media commentator Mac Walsh noted, Hawke and company know that they're going to have to crush the BLF for the preservation of the Hawke government. They decided the BLF has to go. And to eliminate any doubt that it was an orchestrated plan, Clyde Bubb, who was then the CEO of the Master Builders of Australia, said, This is a fully coordinated, carefully structured national campaign dedicated to ridding our $15 billion a year industry of the BLF blight. In 1986, the ACTU was united with the Labor government via the accord, so the logic of protecting a Labor government meant it was going to assist in the assault on the BLF. Rival building unions were tasked to carve up BLF membership and, crucially, the BLF did not mobilise its members to the fullest, especially in its power base here in Victoria. And it discouraged mass picketing of key flagship building sites and was slowly ground to defeat. It was left isolated by its ostensibly friends in the left unions and the ACTU acting as an industrial police force for Hawke's Accord. And they, and they were defeated. So what do we have to do today? Well, working class people can sort out the problems of our unions ourselves, not by government interference. The New South Wales BLF was run by gangsters from 1941 to 1961. The bosses then did not care about corruption because those gangsters never organised a a strike for higher pay, never organised better conditions. New South Wales builders' labourers in that era were paid 15% less than those in Victoria. Only by years of patient organising on the job by a rank-and-file group with its own newsletter, the threats of uh, job recriminations and their own personal safety, we're talking about gangsters, right, Um, did that gangster control end in in union elections of November 1961. And later a group um, led by Jack Money from the Communist Party and Joe Owens and Bob Pringle from the Labor left won full control of the union in 1968. This saw the New South Wales BLF lead two mass strikes in 1970 and 1971 over improved um, ways and conditions, accident, pain, you name it, they won it. And and, and that set the stage for the union implementing um, uh, the Green Bands. They said if we didn't lead our members to that, they wouldn't have backed us on the Green Bands. Now, that new left leadership was to face their own set of problems which they, because they didn't develop uh, rank-and-file activism to a deeper, deeper level. And I'll sum up by saying this. In 2014, uh, uh, Albanese and Labor want to and are expected to deliver to the ruling class. And they, uh, uh, they want to make it clear that Labor will serve their interests. The bosses today are confident and expect this from Labor. We've had 38 years of neoliberalism since the BLFD registration and they would, will not tolerate a failure by Labor to use this opportunity um, with these supposed new corruption allegations to act against the CFMEU. 
Labor has acted in a well-orchestrated way with the media, the ACTU, to bring to heel a militant union and a union that's been willing to um, defy the Labor Party. The ACTU, for its part, it's got along with its tact because its main strategy consists of lobbying Labor for small, incremental legislative reforms. And when you get their emails, you, you can see, oh, we celebrate this is tiny victory because we've got Labor to change the law about something. That's the ACTU strategy. Today, the fight to defend the, the, um, the, the CFMEU mainly depends on how much the CFMEU um, puts, puts up a fight um, to stop being put into administration. And, it's, and, and partly it depends on the left and the unions, the rank and file, who are willing to put out a principal political argument that unions should not be interfered with by any government, let alone a Labor government. Standing on this principle is part of the small chips of building rank and file unionism. If we can't defend our unions, then it makes it so much harder for the high stakes struggle for socialism.